How are we all feeling? Long day? Somewhat depressing, I have to say. Uh, coming in as sort of from someone outside the, uh, the inner sanctum of the, uh, the health profession. Uh, fairly typically, if I get introduced to a, uh, a people at a conference, and I'm introduced as a, uh, a work health and safety or an occupational health and safety consultant, the typical reaction of people is to groan because people have been done to death by regulations and procedures and all that bureaucratic stuff that seems to permeate this field of work, health and safety, which is where we've come up with the, the phrase putting people back into work, uh, safety and, uh, and health. Uh, when uh, I was talking to Paddy, he, uh, we, as he said, we uh, uh, originally met through the uh, Rotary Club of Manningham. We have Gordon also from the same club. Uh, and uh, uh, one thing leads to another, and he was having one of his uh, uh, frequent battles with the regulators, and uh, he wanted to know uh, what the, uh, the then Victorian Occupational Health and Safety Act would have to say about bullying, <coughs> victimisation, harassment and so on. And unfortunately, when we first started the conversation, the answer was, well, it's all a little bit uh, obscure. And then he mentioned Brodie's Law and uh, a very moving presentation from Brodie's parents. Uh, <coughs> Brodie's law at that stage really focused on some a person who was bullying another person, but not so much from the point of view of uh, health and safety legislation. Anyway, so uh, Paddy uh, then said, we're putting on this conference. Uh, would you like to come along and talk about work, health and safety as applies to healthcare? So I said, sure. Uh, only later did I find out that he proposed to put me on as the very last speaker <laughs> on a very long day, talking about a subject that normally goes <laughs> So uh, I totally uh, reworked my presentation, right, to make it a little bit lighter. Uh, I have the original paper I was going to present, were he to give me enough time and, and so on to do it, uh, and it's available on the table outside. Right. Uh, we also have a, a Facebook group. Now, for those of you who are still in Facebook, uh, it's called the Work Safety Healthcare Facebook group, and I'll post this article on that. And by all means, we're, we're getting quite a few people from the health sector, not just in Australia, but around the world, uh, joining that group, and it's starting to develop a little bit of a, a momentum. Uh, so, uh, the first point I should make, I guess, is that our focus in talking about the subject really is to care for the caregivers. Uh, sometimes uh, doctors and nurses, and I was sitting at a table with some midwives, and uh, those of you not here at the moment, she said, don't forget the midwives. Okay, so I've mentioned the midwives. Uh, one, of the, uh, one of the issues, of course, is that uh, they're so busy caring for other people that they uh, sometimes uh, forget about caring uh, for themselves. So, if I start looking at the whole of the healthcare industry from a, a work health and safety point of view, anybody have a guess what the most common source of injuries and claims is in the healthcare industry? Medication. No, no. Back, this, back. back. Well, musculoskeletal disorders is the current term, right? been through lots of different terms, but musculoskeletal disorders accounts for around about 50%, 40 to 50% of, of claims and so on. And you only got to relate to your own experience to understand why. The second most important claim, or most common claim, for many years were slips, trips and falls. Yep. Anybody have a guess what the third one is? And let's call it psychological ill health, is, has been number three. Now, in about the past six to 12 months, there's been a change because, in fact, psychological health, in fact, has become the number two issue. And so concerned is uh, uh, the regulators like WorkSafe Victoria and so on 
uh, about this that they uh, can foresee the whole of the work cover system in Victoria going bankrupt if something is not done to control the incidence, the prevalence, the seriousness of the workers' comp claims surrounding stress and so on. Now we could then ask the question, well where does this stress come from? I'm not going to get in the debate whether stress is a cause or an effect or whether I should be talking about stressors in your work and so on. Uh, in fact, I feel rather inadequate following Sean because I'm going to talk about culture very soon and I suspect you probably wrote the book that I'll be quoting. Uh, uh, yeah, so, uh, and uh, hey, it's uh, not quite as I sent it to you, not to worry. Uh, work, work safe, in fact, in Victoria, and this applies to uh, uh, other, other jurisdictions in Australia, work safe have, are targeting three sectors for uh, psychological health. All right? Emergency services, those are the fire, the ambos, the police. The education system, schools are incredibly dangerous places to be. Right? And uh, some of the stories of bullying and harassment and assault on teachers and particularly principals by parents and by the students are going down to as far as eight-year-olds physically attacking pregnant teachers and so on. Right? Uh, so the education system is in turmoil over the whole issue of uh, psychological health and so on. And of course the, the third one is uh, the health sector, which is pretty much the, uh, the focus of what we've been talking about today. So in the time available we don't have opportunity of going to these into great detail. Uh, a study was done, and I'm sure many of you will be aware of the uh, Royal Australian College of Surgeons, made a series of recommendations uh, and back in 2015, and a whole series of recommendations. I'm not sure, has any one of those recommendations been implemented? No, not to my knowledge. Right. So, and uh, looking at some of the reference material today, uh, I'm seeing references go back 10 or 20 years and we're still talking about the same damn thing. Oh, what is going on? So, uh, Sean, have you seen this stuff before? <laughs> Basically, we need to change the culture, not just of an organisation, and the whole sector. All right? And again, very simplistic terms. What, what in fact I, I find is that when we start talking to people about their work safety, their work health issues, and bear in mind, I digress for a moment. Uh, the Victorian Act is called the Occupational Health and Safety Act 2004. Every other jurisdiction in Australia has now adopted the Work Health and Safety Act 2011, just Victoria's holding out. And yet it was a Victorian Labor government initiative years and years ago to, to, move, uh, to make the transition. Whether we're talking about work health and safety or occupational health and safety, the definition of the term health in the legislation includes psychological health. Uh, and a review has recently been conducted into the operation of the Work Health and Safety Act and there's some significant recommendations that are now going to be considered by regulators one of which is to elevate the whole issue of psychological health up into a regulation, not just a guidance note, which imposes statutory duties imposed on, uh, well, people who manage or control organisations. We call them, Victoria, in Victoria we call them employers, rest of Australia they're called the persons uh, with uh, management and control of uh, the organisation. Uh, so, we now have psychological health being elevated, and I mentioned that to uh, Brodie's parents, because I pointed out that for breaches of these statutory duties, the potential maximum fines at the moment are up to $3 million against a corporation, $300,000 against an individual, and or up to five years imprisonment, except if the individual is an officer, and for that you might as well talk about a senior manager, where the fines double to $600,000 personally and or up to five years imprisonment. And I told Brody's parents you can be rest assured that in years to come, should a repeat occur of Brody's situation, people will go to jail under the, the provisions of the Work Health and Safety Act as well as all the others. 
So, uh, here we are sort of talking psychological health issues all day, and uh, uh, the question is, how do you change the culture of the organisation? How do you change the culture of the industry? Sean's aptly qualified to, uh, to talk about this, but basically, you change the culture of an organisation, uh, well, the, the culture of the organisation comes from the behaviours of the leaders of the organisation. They are the ones who set the culture of an organisation. Leaders will get the behaviours they exhibit and the behaviours they're prepared to tolerate. That's Shine, I think, come up with all of this. Uh, so you, as oh well, leaders, uh, will get the behaviours they exhibit. They set the example. Right? Uh, what they tolerate will set the example for others. Right? Oh, here's Brody's dad's come back. Just I've been talking about you. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, so uh, uh, the, the time that a person walks past an unacceptable behaviour is the time they're saying, I accept that, I approve, I, I uh, concur with that. And it really is time where leaders in the organisation are prepared to draw a line in the sand and saying, enough is enough, we are not going to prepare, uh, tolerate that kind of behaviour in our organisations. Mm -hmm. Thirdly, how do you change the culture of the organisation? It's a bit like turning a battleship, really, isn't it, uh, Sean? You change the culture of the organisation by changing the behaviours of its leaders. Uh, that's easier said than done. When we approach this challenge from the, through the window of uh, work, health and safety, we find that people trust the subject called work, health and safety. And by talking about work health safety issues, that naturally leads into a whole range of, of other issues, particularly to do with uh, change and uh, cultures and values and, uh, and the like. The good news is you don't have to be a manager to be a leader. Right? Leadership comes from your behaviours. You don't have a business card which says leader. So perhaps we can start focusing on the behaviours of the people uh, who are going to set the example and so on. We don't have to wait for the chief executives and all those. Whether they be medically qualified or not, uh, yes, they're, they're obviously part of the leadership team, but so too is every junior nurse. And a very good friend of mine, who I've done a lot of work with around the world on this sort of uh, material, his daughter is 30-ish, uh, she is a, a very experienced nurse, a senior nurse. She has no professed desire to go any further because you've got young family and, and so on. Uh, uh, but uh, she was present at a, uh, a reputable hospital in Melbourne recently when a senior uh, clinician uh, tore strips off a uh, young resident in front of the patient. All right. So Suzanne took aside the clinician, the senior person a bit later on, who was so far above her on the pecking order, he was out of sight. And she told him what he did was quite unacceptable behaviour and what kind of example is he setting for this junior medico should that junior person survive long enough to get to senior levels, they're just going to repeat the behaviour. So all strength to her. Uh, uh, she she didn't care. I know that I mean, that's the part of the issue is those who yeah. call out are often away, enough away from it. And very easy to said and done, isn't it? Right? Particularly if you're concerned about your career and what's going to happen to me. And the best way to uh, have your career stopped in the medical profession would appear to be to, to raise issues. And that's basically what we've been talking about today. But Suzanne, she, I don't care. What are they going to do? Uh, uh, because she was loved by the patient, she was loved by the nurses, she was loved by the junior medical staff. And she told this senior bloke, not on. So, uh, what needs to happen? All right, well, look, we've heard enough today. You don't need me trotting out all the stuff we need to be talking about, uh, about professional bodies. But uh, for heaven's sake, I mean, this is a 2015 report from the Royal Australian College of Surgeons, although I've heard some somewhat uh, unsettling things about racks today, but nevertheless they've got the report 
and uh, their recommendations, there were six or seven major recommendations. Recommendation number one was revolved around cultural leadership. Well, maybe it's about time some of these really nice thoughts actually got put into uh, action. Governments. As I said to Brodie's parents, uh, not only is the whole issue of psychological harm now being elevated into a statutory duty imposed on particularly the employer and, and so on, but there is a new offence going to be created across Australia and Victoria called industrial manslaughter, and there is not the slightest doubt that were that law in place uh, prior to Brodie's situation, people would have gone to, to jail. Right, so, uh, but look, what can the governments do? Right, they're beholden to senior medicos anyway, as far as I can see. Right, uh, totally sort of uh, in awe of uh, the medical profession. Uh, uh, the best they can do is pass laws. Uh, the laws have never been, cannot be, a complete solution to any sort of a social problem like we've been talking about today. There's got to be other things that happen. So employers. Uh, again, the new work health safety laws and so on put a lot of emphasis on senior managers and leaders exercising due <coughs> diligence. That is, they need to take positive steps to make sure the organisation of which they are a leader, a manager, is complying with the necessary laws, in this case here particularly the work health safety laws which specifically refer to psychological health. And it's probably also worthwhile employers, uh, in the generic, generic term, ensuring that their leaders have the appropriate interpersonal skills and leadership capabilities to be the appropriate role models. Uh, the healthcare organisations, be they uh, hospitals, aged care centres, uh, and so it's not just hospitals, we could be talking about just clinics and, and all the rest of it, uh, they need to, to have a look at and particularly they could learn a lot from benchmarking against similar organisations both in the country and, and elsewhere. What are they doing? What are they, the better organisations doing that we can learn some, uh, some lessons from? Uh, the community. Uh, uh, obviously the, the community itself must actively support uh, healthcare resources and so on. I had the uh, experience of having my appendix blow up on me one time and I was admitted into emergency in uh, Box Hill Hospital. Uh, Paddy's comment was, why didn't you call me? <laughs> and I said, because you were in the Balkans at the time and I didn't think you'd probably come back to, to do me. <coughs> Where's the man? Uh, uh, and uh, therefore it was somewhat distressing when a surgeon uh, at Box Hill Hospital uh, uh, confronted a uh, chap in the foyer who was smoking. Now, I have a kind of feeling that maybe this senior surgeon probably didn't use the most diplomatic language. Anyway, the person who he confronted about smoking then proceeded to uh, give him a uh, punch him and he hit the ground and, and he, he since died. Well, that was a bit close to home for me and, uh, and so I start to see, well, this is a community issue, but it's not just occurring in hospitals. Uh, this is something we're seeing in all frontline professions, uh, notably schools. And a lot of these recommendations I've put in the context of healthcare, actually they've come about through a study that was done at Australian Catholic University looking at uh, the problems of uh, violence, assault, intimidation within schools. Right? Uh, domestic violence. So we really need to have an adult conversation that's somewhere along the line about, uh, about these issues. So I just want to leave uh, a thought with you. What, what's this work safety, work health and safety stuff all about? Right? Well, I, I talk about there being two two wheels, if you like, actually talk about the work health and safety bicycle. Are you ready for that at the end of a long day? Mm -hmm. uh, what's work health and safety got to do with a bicycle? Well, uh, there's the frame of the bicycle. There's one side of the bicycle I call the hazards, the technical hazards and risks. Uh, so, number one, we've already talked about uh, manual handling hazards and risks and so on. 
Uh, then we can start talking about other uh, hazards and risks associated with the healthcare industry and, and so on. Uh, and in the context of today, if we actually start taking a few of these out, then we start concentrating and we're left with five, all of which have been the subject of today. So that's one wheel of the bicycle. Uh, the other wheel of the bicycle, I say, relates to the culture of the organisation, the culture of the, pro uh, the profession and, and so on. Right? And uh, you could have written this for me, I'm thinking. <laughs> Uh, but yet, yeah, huh? the interesting thing about a, a bicycle is it's a vehicle for moving people. A bicycle is driven by the rear wheels. So the whole driving force for the uh, work safety bicycle is the rear wheels and the presence of these hazards and risks and the need to do something about identifying them, assessing risks, controlling them and so on but a bicycle goes where the front wheel goes and it's people who control the direction of the wheel. Now for a work health and safety program to be successful, both wheels have to work. There's no good just concentrating on the back one, we've got to be looking at the front one too and it's only when we start combining both together we've got a chance of uh, turning this uh, whole thing around. Paddy, that's enough for me at this stage of the day, I think. Thank you very much. <laughs>